spent the past couple years in a crazy hot market. Louisville home sales decline as demand outpaces supply. Effective communication is at the core of any situation. If you master these two ideas, you'll have a chance of being successful at residential real estate marketing. I think you need to be looking for investment opportunities that move the needle. The market will never crash if demand exceeds supply. This is what I've been telling you all along. This is the Jay Pitt Show. And we're back, folks. Welcome back to the Jay Pitt Show. I'm your host, Jay Pitt. Jay Pitt. Right. <laughs> Can't even say my own name right here on Talk Radio 1080. My co host, Mr. Ryan Harris. Ryan, what's up? What's going on, Jay? You know, it's been a tough week for the city of Louisville. Yeah, yeah, it has, unfortunately. It's been a tough week. What's happened? Yeah. I mean, you know, we don't want to dwell on it, but obviously, being Louisvillians, being people from the state of Kentucky, uh, you know, we've watched from afar while these types of tragedies happen elsewhere. And obviously our condolences always go out to the victims. Uh, but it hit a little close to home this week. Um, if you're not aware, which if you're listening to the show, you're, you're probably painfully aware that, uh, there was a mass shooting. In fact, two mass shootings completely unrelated. It appears, um, you know, the one that is, is grabbing national headlines is the one that was at old national bank downtown on main street. Again, we don't want to really go into too many details, uh, just, you know, that, that we offer our condolences and, um, you know, certainly any help that we might be able to provide and support. I was thankful, um, to not have any personal friends or acquaintance, acquaintance, acquaintances directly involved or directly affected. I do know people that had, had close friends and, and it's just, you know, breaks your heart to hear, um, that, some folks would be so affected and so dejected in life to go out and do something like this and affect completely innocent individuals. I just, I hate it. I feel like we need to open the show today by making a comment on it, but, um, we don't have to dwell. Um, just our thoughts and prayers go out to everybody. Yeah. Just, just an awful thing. Like you said, and I think it really showed how close of a community Louisville is. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew somebody who knew one of the victims and, you know, yeah. Louisville is a very tight city and just very sad thing. So, like yeah. you said, wanted to touch on it, but hate uh, to hear it. Um, but you know, we're 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 about positivity here, so we're going to move on. We're going to talk about some other things. Get back on kind of the regular agenda, the J Pitt Show. Um, Ryan, what we got in store for us first today? Yeah, so show topics today. We're going to talk about a Louisville market update. Uh, pretty interesting stuff there. Mm -hmm. A story from the field. An agent asking us a question. We're going to talk about Zillow, uh, having a new feature for home buyers. Uh, talk about something Warren Buffett said about iPhone and Apple. Uh, going to hit on some sports masters. Baseball's back. Unfortunately, we're going to be talking about HVL, Haley Van Lith leaving Louisville. Uh, and then we'll get into a speech that Jay gave in Nashville oh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. So going to have a good show for you here. And we'll go ahead and get started with the Louisville market update. Yeah. So more of the same, man, just more of the same. We're looking at, you know, I don't, I, I run out of adjectives to use. We talk about the same things just pretty much every week. And that is the, the driving factor of the real estate market here in Louisville is inventory. You know, we could touch on commercial. That's a little bit of a different animal. We do mostly residential within our company, and we think that that, that has a larger impact and uh, on the on you know the economy as a whole, as well as you know most of our listeners. So let's just talk about that. I often compare week similar weeks or, or the same week each year, and I go back to multiple years. So you know, I've told you that inventory levels have been incredibly low, right? Incredibly low. Um, sales and demand is off from 21 and 22, but probably still exceeds 20 um, and certainly exceeds 19. So, you know, you have to really look at the, the comparison between active and available inventory closings and you can get some inference from the amount of pending sales we have. So get right into that listings. We are this past week, we were down 95 listings coming to market in one single week. Okay. Compared to the same week in 22 down 137 from the same week 
in 21. Now, in 20, we were in the thick of the beginning of COVID, so we actually had 24 more listings come to come to market the same week um, as we did in 20. 203 less compared to the same week in 19. Okay, so now we got to look at cumulative uh, impact, okay? Um, with respect to listings, we are down 596 new listings to market year to date compared to 2022. We are down 391 listings compared to 2021. Okay, down 796 from 20, down 956 listings compared to to 2019 which is the most normal market we've seen it's the most normal market we've seen we didn't have the the covid interruption that we had in 21 or the rebound we didn't have incredibly low interest rates as we had in 21 that that drove the market we didn't have uh incredibly low interest rates and the rush to kind of get in before the door slammed shut that existed in 22 right where we borrowed a full year sales or five years worth of sales forward in six months of 2022. So the 2019 was the last year without like a black swan type impactful event. Um, and, and if you really want to talk about health of a market, it's where supply and demand have more balance. We've had no balance. If you look at, if, if you gave us 956 more listings, right. To put us on par, um, over the last, you know, three months, if you put us on par with, with, um, with 2019, I think we, w- we would have a much more balanced market. You would see much less price appreciation, which we're still seeing I actually, you know, fired a, you know, a video, a TikTok I saw, uh, I thought uh you were about to say you fired somebody. No, no, no. I fired a TikTok over to Hannah the uh, last night of, of, of this like parody this guy, this like, uh, you know, influencer, you know, rapper, singer guy that is singing about like, when's the market going to crash? Like, I think I'm never going to be able to afford a home. I keep waiting and waiting and it never happens. He's like, you know, it's it, there's a to, to buy a ranch in my market. It's nine fifty, two hundred thousand 200,000 over list price. I mean, it's just like, when is it going to give? We don't know. We really don't because there's no solution on the horizon for inventory so tell me if i'm wrong here jay but to me it sounds like if we're comparing today's numbers it's best to compare them to 2019 since that is the most normal market we've seen in a while it is and the the disparity the the comparison is staggering so let, let me say this we have 346 more closed sales this year than we had in 19 at the same time period and 956 fewer listings so you can add those two numbers together and you have like a thir- 1,300 property swing of available inventory out there for sale. To put that in perspective, I could look it up, but we're running somewhere in the neighborhood of only 1,500 active for sale properties right now. We're talking about a whole doubling of our market that is not available. Does that make sense? So, so you take the fact that we have 956 fewer properties come to market and 356 more that have closed and sold and come off the market. Take those two numbers together. That's like 1,300. We only have 1,500 properties for sale. What do, what do homes sell, sold this year compared to last year? Homes sold this year compared to last year are down. Closings, we are down 800 sales compared to 2022 we're only down 170 compared to 2021 okay okay so what you're really looking at is the peak of frenzy was q2 of 2022 we were ju- we're just getting to the point where last year things were going ballistic okay so 170 we still have 45 more sales this year than we had year to date in 2020. Now, obviously we were a month into COVID at that time. So April wasn't a, you know, end of March and April weren't good months. Um, but, but, you know, 346 more sales than 2019 year to date. It's, it's mind blowing. Now it listing is. seasons coming up. Yeah. You know, you talk about there's, there's seasons in real estate, just sure. like there are, uh, you know, the four seasons, spring, winter, fall, yep. summer. Do you think we'll see a significant increase in listings. The 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 hang up there with the answer to that question is significant. What is significant? Yeah. Okay, so we'll see desperately needed increase in inventory. 
desperately needed. Will it be significant enough to change the dynamic of the market? Probably not. Right? You'll see, you'll start to see maybe as summer wanes, um, a few less, you know, over market sales, you know, or, or over list price sales, but pretty much we're so disparate. We're so short of inventory right now that all the best listings are selling above, above list price. Um, it's it, almost hard to see there being enough listings coming to market ever again. Well, I don't know. I think short of some type of stimulus, some type of government intervention, which is counter to the narrative that we see. Okay. Like we, we, seem to right the the federal government now the current administration seem to want to stimulate the economy from the bottom up which that makes great sense i totally understand and appreciate you know providing support for the less privileged right the folks that need they need a hand totally get that um and, and the problem with that is you do that by stimulating more demand Okay, almost every solution provided tax credits and, you know, lowering the BIPs on FHA loans, on mortgage insurance on FHA loans, about 30 basis points. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to lower the cost of ownership, which is great in theory, except when, when promoting ownership creates more demand with limited supply, price goes up and it ends up counter, counteracting the, the, the stimulus you're trying to do. Right. If they were to give, like, there was talk at the beginning of the Biden administration of a thirty thousand dollar, you know, home buyer tax credit. Right. That just simply would have made homes thirty thousand more expensive. So anyway, we can uh, we can we can wrap this up after the break, Ryan. I think we got to get to a couple of sponsors. Uh, this is the J Pitt Show right here on Talk Radio ten eighty. We'll see you real soon. And we're back, folks. Welcome back to the J. Pitt Show right here on Talk Radio 1080. Ryan, just to put a bow on what we were talking about before the break, the bottom-up stimulus, okay, ends up increasing demand, which increases prices when you don't change supply. I don't see builders being able to create more inventory because that would require kind of middle or top-end stimulus you know, reducing the cost to build, reducing the cost of land, reducing the cost of of trades and materials, allowing them to bring more affordable inventory to the market would allow them to bring more inventory to the market. Okay. That supply relief, okay, would allow prices to stabilize and stop inclining at such a rapid pace. I don't see it happening. I think it's going to probably take a new administration and a new federal government. Maybe that happens in 24. Maybe it doesn't. But I'm like you. Help is not on the way. Yeah, it's that never-ending cycle we've talked about before on this show. When you try to help people afford homes, it ends up creating more demand. And what does more demand do? It makes prices rise, which in the end makes homes less affordable for those people that are trying to help. Yeah. It's a tough situation, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. See how it plays out. Well, Nobody and, really knows. And you're not going to get it from existing inventory either, because it's estimated upwards of sixty percent of people are financed at less than three point five percent on their primary their primary residence. So those people have little to no incentive with prices still inclining to come to market. They can't even they can't even actualize their increase in equity by selling. Okay, because they're going to have to replace the property they sell and finance at seven and a quarter or 6.75 or whatever the going rate is. So there's just there's no relief to be had, really. And, and unfortunately, if you look at like on a price per square foot basis or, you know, an entry level price, average prices per incomes around the world in much older societies have gone this very same way. The playbook exists in Western Europe. It's the closest thing to our style of life, okay, that exists on the planet. It's the only thing older than us, I should say, because, you know, Canada's a relatively new country as well. I'd say they've got a pretty similar lifestyle to us, but you don't, you know, they've also got a huge land mass with tons of supply. Europe kind of seems like the model we're following and home ownership is just not affordable. I don't know if we're headed towards a day where home ownership is ceases to become the American dream. That's unfortunate. Yeah. 
All right, we put a bow on that. A very we tied a very complicated bow on that. That's like, right. Maybe we needed to it's go like to a Boy double Scouts Wins- for that. It was like a double bow, Windsor but, uh, necktie knot. There. The bow is there. <laughs> so, all right, let's go jump to a story from the field. So this sure. agent asked Jay, "What choices do you have when your clients buy a home and at closing find out the sellers only had keys to the front door, keys to the back door, garage, and storage room outside have no keys?" I think this question. If you've ever bought a home, this has probably happened to you. So if you're listening, you're probably interested. Jay, what options are there? Okay, so um, it, this is an interesting one. Th- there are a couple of very simple, almost almost obtuse, you know, simple. So simple, there are obtuse answers to this. But nobody likes simple. Nobody likes simple. I will. And, and, and you know, it's never an issue until it's an issue. So I'll just say that. And, and honestly, the argument I make probably depends on what side I'm on, yeah. um, to be fair. And that's just because I like to help my clients win. And so here it is. Um, I have one key to the front door of my personal residence. It's what I received when I bought the house, and I very rarely use it. I open the garage. I have an attached garage. Some houses in Certain parts of towns don't have that. Got it. No biggie. Obviously, a different story there. But I open the garage. I pull into my garage. I go in through the door to the door to the house from the garage, and that's that. Um, some people don't care. Some people do care. For those that care, you need to negotiate what you want to receive as specifically as you require it in the very beginning on the contract when you make the offer. Unfortunately, doing things like this, making tedious requests at the time of offer, in light of the last conversation we had with no inventory out there, multiple bids, multiple offers, houses selling in hours, not days, it makes you seem like an unreasonable buyer. A lot of times buyers forget Once they get the property locked up and the leverage has swung in the other direction, they like to forget that they didn't ask for what they wanted at the time of offer because it wouldn't have helped them get the property under contract. And to be fair, I bet sellers forget a lot of times too until closing like, oh shoot, I don't have have keys keys. for these doors. Like, Here's the keys I've had. These are the ones I've had every time. I, I, I think that it's a surprise that it never was like a disclosure item or that's what I was going to say. It seems like this can be easily solved if on the seller's disclosures. That was a question. Do you have keys to every door? With I think on that it? probably would have happened, Ryan, if technology had not moved away from the necessity of hard keys. I mean, you have smart locks and coded doors and Wi-Fi enabled doorbells and door locks and, garage door openers like that a lot of people you know what i mean there's there's it's become less of a necessity but i digress you need to write it into the contract if you don't write it in the contract you can't be upset that you don't get it okay it may it may be a bummer but here's the here's the silver lining you're buying a used home okay we're not having this discussion if we're talking about new construction because the builder is going to provide you with keys to every lock multiple keys okay It's a used home. Do you know who has keys to those locks? Yeah, you probably want to get new locks. You probably want to get your locks rechanged, you know, your locks changed. So um, I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time. What recourse do you have? The answer, unfortunately, if it's not in the contract, you have none. You can say it's unreasonable. You can make threats. You can probably, you know, be, uh, you know, um, difficult enough to to get a, a, a. an easygoing person to relent and give you what you want. You know, if your agent's a bulldog and the, and the other agents a pushover, yeah, you might get something. You might get, you know, 150, 200 bucks to, to put towards changing your locks. If you throw a big enough fit at the closing table and refuse to sign, but do you want to be that person? That's yeah. the question that, you know, this brings up an even better, better question issue that people have a lot. Or what are the like fixtures in a house that people have to leave? And so what are those and what what can a buyer do after the fact that let's say a seller takes a TV mount that they weren't supposed to take? Okay. So the, the TV mounts are, are a hot topic. Um, they become much more popular the last couple of years. Um, you know, basically the rule is anything that's attached permanently 
um, that you can't just like grab and pull off the wall. Like, you know, the picture that hangs on a hook. Well, that's, that's not a fixture. Um, there are a few tricky ones. TV mounts are, are fixtures because they're bolted into the studs or into the drywall. Um, they leave big holes. They mark up walls. Um, you know, a lot of times buyers get really frustrated when they see those big bolt holes coming out of the walls. With I mean, screw anchors, s- in screw them. anchors. I, honestly, they become so inexpensive. Um, relatively speaking, you know, forty nine dollars will buy you pretty much any mount. You can buy them in a hundred different places. You buy them on Amazon, and they're at your doorstep the next day. That's eased the challenge they they were a really big issue when they were like 150 or 200 bucks you know because people didn't want to pay that kind of money now people just more people just start leaving them because they don't here's here's the kicker if you take the tv mount you got to patch you're you're supposed to patch the holes that it leaves that's not fair wear and tear that exceeds you know the broom swept fair wear and tear type condition that the buyer has agreed to accept the property so if you take it the buyer may have a damage to claim right um, other fixtures, you know, like hot tubs are a big one that, that busted me up once in my career. Um, I spent a whole lot of money for, paid my client a whole lot of money, um, because I made a mistake, you know, for their 20 year old hot tub. It was, it was, um, I thought it was, pl- it was a plug in. It was not, it was hardwired. So, you know, you could look at things like, like a mini split, um, uh, even if it's not recessed into the wall like maybe maybe it's a plug-in and that would in at the in that case not be a fixture if it's hardwired like a whip hardwired into the panel that is a fixture even if it's not recessed into the wall obviously if it's recessed into the wall and would leave a massive hole then that's a fixture um you know hot tubs tv mounts um dishwashers you know it there are dish there are plug-in uh dishwashers that have wheels on them that you can roll around some some houses you'll find that that's not a fixture but if it's recessed into the cabinets and 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 hardwired it's a fixture curtain rods curtain rods are fixtures they they are specifically mentioned in our contract though and so they are presumed to stay in the contract and listed by name along with a number of other fixtures um wall-mounted telephones believe it or not back in the corded days you know corded telephones they were actually a big big topic um because they they plug into the wall with a hard line and people are like does it stay does it go um the the general rule of thumb is if it leaves a big hole and you take it you got to patch it and if it is permanently affixed it remains basketball goals what's it is it a fixture it's bolted into the ground i would say that definitely is it's definitely a fixture moral of the story is though if you want to be 100 percent sure Put it in a contract. Yeah, and because you don't know what other what assumptions other people are making, that's the truth. Like they assume a basketball goal is not because you know, yeah, it's bolted down, but like you just pop a few bolts off and it comes right up. Like, eh, it's a fixture. Yep. All right, put it in the contract, people. Uh, that's <laughs> it. We're gonna cut to a couple sponsors, and we'll be back on the Jay Pitt Show, Talk Radio, ten eighty. All right. Welcome back to the Jay Pitt Show, Talk Radio 1080. Jay, let's talk about a new Zillow feature they have on their website. Uh, I'll read this here from mm-hmm. Broke Agent Media, which we use use their stuff a lot. It's great. It's a media company in the real estate space. Uh, here's what it says. With Zillow's newest filter now available on the Zillow app and coming soon to Zillow.com, buyers looking for homes can now search based on monthly payments. The new filter uses up-to-date information and mortgage rates and housing prices to calculate monthly housing costs and suggest affordable options. So basically, people can go into Zillow, put the monthly amount they're willing to spend, and Zillow will show them the homes in their market that fit that price range. I mean, so Zillow's smart. Okay, I'm not going to say they've never made mistakes, never made business missteps. Of course they have. Um, but Zillow is attempting to play into something that real estate professionals have pretty much, if if you're not asleep at the wheel, you've always known to be true. And that is buyers. Most of them, 95% of them are payment buyers, right? Um, 
they they will buy they will figure out what they can afford in a mortgage and they will buy nearly 100% of what they can afford that's why there's never been a time that's more indicative of this than recent years right you know the 2021 and 20 first half of 2022 craze that we saw and really the latter half of 2020 for that matter so it's like 2 years running from you know the middle of summer in 2020 to the summer of 22 the buying craze and the, and the peak demand we saw was as a result of interest rates being incredibly low with interest rates incredibly low affordability explodes right so people were upgrading they upgraded because of payment payment affordability zillow also has the initiative to drive a mortgage company okay zillow mortgage was publicized as just losing a ton of money here recently and they really need to drive traffic i think that this as zillow was still the best that's ever existed the best mousetrap of getting you know home buyers to raise their hand um they they want to they want to use that to translate to a mortgage quote i think that is very smart on their part um it serves interest that they've got a huge investment in and you know i mean zillow's Zillow's got a pretty good track record for for assessing what the consumer wants. This estimate was a huge hit, no matter how much we will malign it as an industry, right? Um, they they have some really actionable market data that the results didn't pan out that led them to believe that eye buying um, was would be appealing to a good segment of the population. They weren't able to execute, but there's a serious segment of the population under the right market conditions that would love to just sell their house without any hassle. I think that was proven correct. I think this is just another iteration. They're, they're, you know, wanting to show folks, Hey, here's what your payment is. Dude. It's so funny. Consumer finance expert. They quote, literally quote the finance expert at Zillow home loans in this article. Sorry. That just hit me. Um, I think that is pretty much the long and short of this article. Like you said, Zillow is smart. I am not a Zillow hater like a lot of the industry is. Nope. I do get it, but I think they've done a lot of good things for the industry as I well. Uh, you know, not a hater. I think, yeah, I mean, they're smart. I think this is a good decision by them. I do think it's a it's one they could have made a little bit easier. It's not a crazy feature ad no. that adds uh, like you said, agents have been talking about this for a long time. Like Zillow could have added this a while ago. They are now. Yep. And, you know, you talked about too, Zillow tried the offers platform. What they're good about is cutting things that don't work. Mm -hmm. So if something doesn't work, they're going to cut it. So I think, I think it's going to be good. Uh, see if it leads to creating more leads for agents. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's cool Sh to see. Shout out to my man, Jason Pantana in the, in the, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the sideline what do they what do they call those ads on the side they're not side it's banners. not a banner it's a side banner that's what it is it's not it so so for for our listeners that don't know this is my real estate coach he is we pull up this article and there is smiling faces i'm gonna send him this episode make him listen to it since he got a shout out dude you i can tag I, him on social media I, I will we'll do that we'll do that hannah make a note chop it up all right what, what we got next Ryan? yeah so this is we're gonna talk about warren buffett and Apple. So this is a quote from nine to five Mac. This is, this is interesting and got me to thinking cause I think he's a hundred percent right in this, but here it is. He says, it's no secret that Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway are big fans of Apple. And last month, the conglomerate revealed that it had farther expanded its already massive holding of Apple stock in a new interview on Wednesday. Buffett once again sang the praises of Apple CEO Tim Cook and iPhone loyalty. Speaking to CNBC on Wednesday morning, Buffett praised how well Cook has led Apple during his tenure as CEO. I don't disagree. In quotes, Tim Cook is one of the classiest CEOs and he understands the business, Buffett said. Tim Cook has managed the company in an extraordinary way. Buffett also explained why he thinks Apple has such a strong loyalty brand. Now, here, here's what I found very interesting. He says, if you're an Apple user and somebody offers you $10,000, but the only provision is you can never they'll take away your iPhone and you'll never be able to buy another, you're not going to take it. I if they tell it. you if you buy another Ford car, they'll give you $10,000 not to do that. You'll take that $10,000 and you'll buy a Chevy instead. I agree. And I'm a Ford guy, and we have a lot of Ford influence locally, but you could not pay me to, to be an Android user. No. 
Like I literally will go so far as like we joked in the office the other day, our agent application, we're going to start asking if you're an Android or iPhone user. Are you joking about it or not? You- I mean, I kind of want to do it. Like that that's not like uh free of it's not like uh and to explain it, it's because software issues. Well, there you know, are software right? issues, yes, but it's just, it's just it's frustrating. They they mess up your group text. Like there's some really good like, you know, co- comedy out there surrounding this particular discussion. Oh, yeah. But it's just like, yeah, you can't group text them, you can't FaceTime them, you can't do a lot of things. You know, in our office, we have a lot of lead sources that have direct transfer leads. All the Android users' phones ring later than the iPhone users. Yeah. So, and, and as if that weren't enough to get people to switch. I guess it's not because some people are just really – people are very – and I get it. It's the most probably personal – it's more personal to – my phone is more personal to me than my wallet. You know, I mean, a, a man's wallet and, and a woman's purse probably were the most personal items, like, that you carried – for 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 generations right now it's your phone yeah, you know you know big reason for that though it's, it is actually apple's fault they use different technology for their iMessage that security standards actually aren't as good on it anymore and there's there's some um, talk and lawsuits going on trying to get apple to switch from that but it's been going on well for the a funny long time. thing is is nobody cares enough to make it yeah. happen like big question you, is how much would somebody have to pay you to how much ma- oh phone? Do you have? I don't amount? even. I don't even want to. I don't even want to quote a number, dude. I don't know. I don't know. Like yeah, I had. To, if like, you say a number, people are just going to think like, "Oh, this guy." Million bucks. Yeah, million bucks. Like I'd probably do it for that. But I mean, <laughs> I seriously don't want to do it. I don't even want to c- contemplate. That's that's how bad it is. I got I got my first iPhone in when I when I got into real estate initially in 2007. The iPhone had just came out. And I bought, I got the first iPhone and it blew my mind. I had a Palm Trio, right? Had Blackberries, like blew my mind. Like it, it, it almost makes this job not worth doing if you don't have. Now I realize that an Android does almost, but like when you tell people that their security standards are better, like they're just like, oh yeah, this guy, this, oh, here goes the Android guy. <laughs> I it, don't have an Android. I know you don't. I know you don't. Hey, I, I do want to say something else though. Like, I totally agree with, with Buffett on Tim Cook. I mean, the dude is just, I mean, like to think that Apple could, you know, could replace Steve Jobs with somebody that would do that well is pretty staggering. And, and in my own personal life, so this is one thing that my parents decided for each of my children they were going to buy the kids stock um, in certain companies when they were born. They did a, a larger kind of nest egg, what what have you, when they were born. And then they do a nominal every year investment on their birthday. So my daughter, Evelyn, for some reason, she got Apple. That was her first like big chunk. And they pick one stock. They don't spread it around. She's this a is, smart investor already. So she was, she. I mean, she had no idea. So my brother's daughter um, was born three months earlier, got something completely different. Like Evelyn's portfolio is like, she, she that was okay. So I'm going to tell you that was, I just looked it up. Okay. So Ju- on, she was born on, she was born in June of 2017. Okay. In July, on July 3rd, the price of Apple stock was at $36 and four cents. What do you think it's at now? A couple hundred bucks. 161. So she got a nice chunk of Apple stock at $36 a share when she was born. When did you say you bought that? It was, it would have been, on July 3rd, that was the price. She was born on June 27th of 2017. Got it. So just her portfolio is like running circles around like her cousin and her siblings because she got Apple and like we got one of my kids has got Google and you know, we, 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 we were, we were down with the tech stocks at the right time. So they're all doing pretty well. Yeah. But, uh, like she's, she's almost catching her 10 year old brother. You know what? I'll be buying my first kid in August. What's that? Oh, it's Bitcoin. Come on. Oh, well, you know, I mean, of course, of course. We need to talk about that a little more after the break. All right, folks, I think that's about all we got uh, for segment three. We're going to catch up with some sponsors, and we'll be right back on the J. Pitt Show on Talk Radio 1080. Welcome back to the J. Pitt Show, Talk Radio 1080. All right. 
We've talked about a lot already. Now let's talk a little bit about sports. The Masters just ended last weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm a golf nut, golf nerd, whatever you want to call me. Played in college. Absolutely love it. It's the time of year when everybody's watching golf, and it's so interesting to see on social media and just friends that never watch golf any other week watch it, which that makes some people mad. I love it. If you hate that as a golf fan, uh, yeah. I don't care about you. Like You should love that. It gets Anyth- everybody into it. Anything that brings more people to your sport, more attention, more notoriety, I think you got to be a fan of. Yeah. John Rom, the winner. It's awesome. Did you get to watch any of it? I did. I watched. I watched. Um, I actually watched most of it. We, well, I take that back. I watched a practice round. Then we were traveling on the first day back from spring break, so I didn't get to watch the first day. Of course, there were delays and that kind of thing. I, I got to watch m- the delayed telecast uh, because you know it, it got rained out, so they re-aired everything they had back to back, and so I. I got to start late and watch all of round two that they got in. I watched them finish two and three the next day and then finish three and four the final day. I watched pretty much all of it, man, to be honest. And I was I was on and off on Easter, so, you know, whatever. I, we had family over, so I was back and forth. But but definitely watched. I loved that it ends later. Like, like Sunday, if it always ended at like 7, 7.30 awesome. – I, I it, that's money for me. I was going to say that. Got to watch thirty plus holes of golf because people still weren't done with their third round. So Dude. woke up, started watching at seven thirty. Cup of coffee, and I watched golf for twelve hours Sunday, <laughs> and wasn't. I even got a little golf nap in there. Dude, everybody knows the, a Sunday golf nap. The is, Masters nap. The Masters golf nap is the amazing thing, though. Wait till you. Well, wait till you have. Wait till you have a little one that you're sitting there in your chair with. And you take the you take the golf nap with the little one next year, dude. That's that's where it's yeah. at. I mean, just a great Sunday. Sam Bennett, amateur, just destroyed. He did awesome. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he got top twelve, which is what you need to well, he, get in the next year. He missed a, like a six footer on eighteen to drop a shot that yeah. he shouldn't have probably but, dropped. Um, but. So he did awesome. He flew back that night. Was actually going to play in a college golf tournament the next day on Monday. Decided not to because. Uh, it was carrying his own bag, and it was 36 holes in a day. So, so he was he was exhausted. His play, team still won the tournament. Played 30 on Sunday at the Masters, probably the most mentally exhausting and draining day of golf in his career. And then he's got to carry his own bag for 36 yeah. the next so, day. And his team, Texas A&M, they still won their tournament without without him. Somebody who finished top 20 in the Masters. Uh, another another amateur that was in it, Gordon Sargent. Uh, plays for Vandy. He's a sophomore this year. Won national championship last year as a freshman. He missed the cut, but he went back and did play in his team's tournament Monday and Tuesday. Won by six shots. Mm-hmm. He's number one player in the country. Hits it farther than Rory. I don't know. Golf's exciting right now. There's a lot of good amateurs coming up, and uh, it's great, great for the sport. I agree. You know, you hate seeing Tiger have to bow out with injury. Unfortunately, I don't know what that means for his recovery or you know, resumption of his career, his playing career. Did He's, you hear what Jason Day said about him? I didn't. At I, th- I don't know if it was – it might have been last year's PGA Championship when he had to withdraw. Apparently he did it because one of the screws in his leg pierced his skin. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, to think – number one, I will just say I like – the relationship that Tiger has forged with a lot of the young players, local, you know, uh, beloved, you know, top, what, 10 golfer in the world, you know, Justin Thomas was a former number one in the world. I think at one point he and Tiger obviously have a great relationship. Tiger is so friendly with the young players. I feel like he's just such a great, he's turned, he's, he used to be such an intimidating figure right for the other players on the tour and he was just so like i don't want to say cutthroat but like just going to steal your soul out there on the course and he's he's warmed you know he's he he's settled into his kind of slightly more gentle you know uh, statesman of golf kind of role i just i'd hate to see him not play anymore because you just love i mean dude I know that there's a far cry between him and Fred Couples, but seeing the like Fred Couples' performance, it's awesome, you know, cool. like I, like it really kind of irks me because I've never really been a been a been a lefty fan, a Mickelson fan. Like I think it's because he always thought he he could play with Tiger, and it was just no comparison to me. And 
the fact that Phil finishes tied for second and still has it, but now we do, but we don't get Tiger. Like I want, how is yeah. Phil still doing? Phil's it? second was uh, it was he ba- weird. He Nobody really it. talked about it, and he did it. And you know, there's been some antics lately with him that. Uh, like he went to more people not like him. Him you know, going live. to live like that's a whole nother argument. I'm not a huge fan, but pay I, off some gambling debts. Well, that's true. And and the Phil's just I don't know the the whole live thing kind of gets me a little bit. Um, obviously, whatever the move, it's fairly recent, right? That Brooks made the move, so like it, it has done something for helping him resurrect. Yeah, I think Brooks will be back once his contract's over with Live. Wow, I think most of them will be. Uh, but yeah, JT. You know, I don't think he's been number one in the world yet. Has he's he actually, not? and then home, t- yeah, hometown boy just dropped out of the top ten of the world golf rankings for the first yeah. time in a while. He'll get it back though. It's, I mean, it's golf. Uh, yeah. Yep. Well, well, we'll Rory's talk. back up. I mean, Rory, you know, Rory's not number one anymore because John Rahm is. But wasn't he? He was number uh, one. Scotty Scheffler was Scheffler one. was one, and but, but Rahm and Rory was two. Rahm was three. Now Rahm's one. Okay. So you know, I mean, and but there was a time when Rory was was out of the top ten. Yeah, he's so, played awful. So it's anyway, uh, it's it, dude. Masters weekend is my favorite year golf golf weekend of the year, which it should be. It's exactly what you need after March Madness. Dude, dude, it all is. the craziness, and then you just have the Masters. Totally agree. And Jim Nance's voice again. Totally. <laughs> Much more subdued version of Jim yeah. Nance. Uh, all right. You know, let's talk about HVL. Dude. Van I, yeah. Sad. I, I'm, well, she's just electric. And, and we just saw, right, obviously some, some controversy between Angel Reese and, and um, Caitlin, Caitlin Clark. Clark. You know, in the final game, whatever they're both killers. Like they're they're both unbelievable. Ass. But but Haley Van Lith had she was Louisville's version. She had that lightning in a bottle, electric personality. And most people, actually, a lot of people don't know, right? The Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark beef had something to do and was connected with Haley Van Lith because Haley Van Lith was the one talking trash to Caitlin Clark the game before when she did the John Cena face wave that was actually at HVL yeah okay and then obviously Angel Reese mocked that after she beats beats her in the in, in the in the final game you know here's the thing i don't mind i don't want to hear sportsmanship from these old crusty people that <laughs> i don't like sports not but but the it's their own way it's entertainment okay? i will tell you this I that 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 final game was appointment television for me because of Caitlin Clark. Now I learned about Angel Reese in that game because she's an incredible talent. I don't think Angel Reese is anywhere near the talent Caitlin Clark is. Okay, I mean, and that's not a race thing. That's not a anything. It's the real deal thing. Like Caitlin Clark in a bad performance made nine threes. Okay, and like. Where is her team? Her team, I thought, played well, but she kept them in the ball game down the stretch. And you had some people on LSU that just had like career performances. You know, hats off to everybody involved. I wish they wouldn't make, you know, feuds, but like they could talk all the trash they want during the game as long as you back it up. Yeah, we were talking right before this about. If I was Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and HVL, I'd go to the same school and play together. <laughs> Every single game would be on the biggest national television yeah. channel you can think of, and they would rake in. Dude, the and that's and that's the, the big knock, right? The big knock on women's sports is it doesn't have the draw. It doesn't have the ticket sales. It doesn't have the merch sales. Like It doesn't have the TV viewership, so there's not money in the game to pay the players because they don't bring the eyeballs. So that would be cool. Yeah, it's sad to see. Get it. Uh, I don't think anybody at Lowell has anything against her. But, nah. uh, but you know, uh, Je- Jeff Walls will be fine. Yeah. Dude, he's in the portal. He's, he's awesome. doing it. He's doing his thing. Yeah. All right, real quick. Well, baseball's back. Have you watched any with the uh, pitch clock? Uh, yes, and I'm seeing some people manipulate the pitch clocks, quick pitching. I hate the, I hate the pitch clock. I, I get speeding up the game, but, like, you know, th- now they won't get batter's time. Right. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are, it's it just, it's having too much. It's monkeying with the game too much. Yeah, games are like two and a half hours, which it's good if you're watching on TV. But when I go to a baseball game, I kind of like to hang out, yeah. have some beers, you know? I just, I, I'm a game purist, you know? I mean, it, it would be like, it's like if they change golf to 12 holes <laughs> or, or, or tell, um, you know, John Rom 
stepped off the ball, you know, to reline up his last putt on 18 in the Masters, it's like penalizing him in a shot for for taking too long to putt that. Are they going to be so Triple A the bats? Are they going to yeah, have the pitch clock? I don't too? think so. I think it's only Major League. Only Major League. I think it's only MLB. Well, that's good. Then I can go hang out at the bats game. That's right. Get there early. Dollar beers. Anyway, we're running running out of time, Ryan. Yeah. Talk sports, Warren Talk sports. Buffett, Zillow, yeah. story from the fields. Good show. Yeah. Anything else you want to touch on? Dude, I, no. I, 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 um, I really just you know, want our listeners to keep an eye out on this inventory thing. We talked about it at the open of the show. It really drives the market. It's what's driving the market nationwide. You're seeing stories come out of the West Coast where sales are falling on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, sales are strong. Even major metropolitan areas. On the East Coast, sales are still great. And it's just simply – it's simply because, okay, there's slightly more inventory in these markets than there is in others. And that is truly the answer right now. I, I would love to see some creative solutions around stimulating supply-side economics versus always demand-side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I completely agree. It's the one thing you need to pay attention to when you see a headline that sees that says home sales are falling. Go read it, yeah. and you're going to see it is because not because people don't want to buy homes. It's because there's no supply. We keep saying it. We'll probably you're you're probably going to hear it from us a lot. Yeah. So v- very uh, next episode, you're probably going to hear the same exact thing. All right, folks, that's all the time we got for this episode. We genuinely appreciate you uh, signing on. And listening to us wherever you listen. Don't forget you can find us wherever you podcast as well. Uh, But we'll be back right here next week on Talk Radio 1080. This is the Jay Pitts Show for myself and for my co-host, Mr. Ryan Harris. We'll see you soon. See you.